Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So, last week we were discussing the emergence of these major philosophical and religious moments that we will be trying to both understand and revitalize. Last week, of course, we turned to Christianity, and beginning today, we turn to Buddhism. Now, as we mentioned last week, when these start emerging, they appear in two separate moments with some variations, and both of these moments are reactions against a very common set of themes across Eurasia. So to quickly reiterate, and then we will see how Buddhism plays upon these permutations. So as we noted, across Eurasia prior to the mid first millennium BCE, it was a world of absolutely predefined social hierarchy in which what you would do in life was based entirely upon your birth. There was almost no social mobility um, to the limited degree there seems to be. As we noted, it was within your particular group, depending on whether you did well or not, playing that role, but you could not shift roles. So if you're born a king, if you're born a priest, if you're born a peasant, there you will remain. And as we noted, the religions very much assumed this world. So the religions of the day were polytheistic, with the higher deities only available to the priestly class. That priestly class had, by definition, unique access to them. They would work on behalf of the kings, who again were hereditary monarchs. And the lower classes, if they had access to any deities, would be, by definition, the lesser deities that could not contest these higher powers. As we noted, also, in terms of the actual actions of the priestly class, the primary one was sacrifice. So sacrifice and divination was another one, both of which entailed attempts to connect that priestly class and the king on whose behalf they were operating with these higher powers. <coughs> Beginning in the first millennium BCE, you have, as we noted, a radical shift of all of these. Number one, a radical attempt to break the social hierarchies, albeit in radically different ways. One of the key claims being that there was a higher truth far greater than the deities who were the objects of sacrifice. Moreover, there are sets of spiritual practices available to everyone, regardless of birth, to gain access to that higher truth. Not surprisingly, these tended to be therefore anti-sacrificial religions because the movement was to call for a rejection of the sacrificial practices that had underlain the previous religious and social hierarchy of the Bronze Age. And accordingly, the attempts in varying ways was to create a radically new form of community on these new spiritual practices. As we noted, there were two major moments in these processes. The first, in the mid-millennium, the halfway through the first millennium BCE, you have, looking across Eurasia, on the one end, of course, a Socrates, a Plato, and Aristotle in Greece. On the other end, on China, you had a Confucius and a Lao Tzu. And in South Asia, our concern for today, you had the Buddha, all rough contemporaries. And then, as we noted, a few centuries later, beginning in the first few centuries of the Common Era, you have many of these ideas being picked up in the emergence of strong salvationist religions, sort of a radicalization of this first moment. In this radicalization, you see the emergence of, again, looking across Eurasia, on the western end, Christianity, which we discussed last week. On the other end, you see the emergence, something we mentioned very briefly, what we'll discuss later a bit more, the emergence of things like the celestial masters, the salvationist form, in other words, of Taoism. And turning again to South Asia, our concern for today, we will see the emergence of new forms of salvationist Buddhism, also that will play into a lot of these more dominant comparative possibilities. So to organize our discussion, I suggest we begin with the Buddha himself, begin with his story, begin with his teachings, then turn to how his story and his teachings are read and reinterpreted in the tradition, and as we go, introduce the major doctrines, 
the major theories and the various ways these became institutionalized and domesticated after this radical revolutionary period. So let us begin with the Buddha. We are now in sixth, fifth centuries before the Common Era. Again, roughly the same time as Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, Confucius, and Lao Tzu on either end of Eurasia. And in this period, a figure named Siddhartha Gautama is born. He is born the son of a prince. I mean, I'm sorry, he is a prince. He is born the son of a king. And that king decides he wants his son to live a life of pure happiness and contentment with no suffering of any kind. And so the father builds a special part of the palace for his son. In this special part of the palace, nothing will be in any manner, shape, or form bad. Nothing will ever change. At night when his son is asleep, any thing that begins to crack on the walls, if paint begins to peel off, it will be quickly repaired, so everything will be permanently wonderful. It will be filled with servants who will cater to his every desire. Everything will be constantly given to him, whatever he wants. And if any of those servants become sick at any point, of course, we send in another one immediately, so he'll never even see sickness. If, over time, they begin to age, since one is a child for a relatively long period of time, they'll be replaced quickly. So he will never have a sense of aging, of sickness, and never want for anything, because anything he desires will be given to him. He grows up, the father foolishly thinks, happy and contented. But something seems a little off. And trying to understand what is off, he's still relatively young, he asks his father if he can leave the palace. And the father says, no, 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 no. It's perfect here, just stay, stay, it's perfect. And Siddhartha keeps asking and asking, and finally the father agrees. But first he sends out his troops to organize the path on which his son will travel, to take away anyone who is aged or sick and everything is spruced up. So it will simply look like a wonderful road. And the Siddhartha travels down this road and things seem fine, but something is still off. And he asks for more trips. And on one of these trips, despite the king's best efforts, he notices, the Siddhartha, I mean, notices someone who is aged, who's quickly pushed aside. And Siddhartha says, whoa, 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 what is this? What is this? And the father says, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. But Siddhartha keeps pushing for more trips. And slowly he begins to realize that, yes, <laughs> there are aged people. There are sick people. There are people who are suffering. And it slowly begins to dawn on him that, in fact, he's kind of known this all along and was secretly, although unintentionally at a young age, playing into his father's desires for his own happiness. And he began to realize, of course, even within the palace, he was not seeing agedness and sickness, but surely he was beginning to notice and now finally coming to full realization that when he would simply demand things of the servants, when he would use strong tones of voice, they get who were very, very good at saying, oh, yes, yes, of course. But there was clearly something going on there, some deep unhappiness that he was creating, some suffering that he was creating that he was willfully ignoring. And it becomes clear to him that his entire life has been an illusion built by his father and to some degree, even if completely unintentionally, with which he was complicit in creating a world in which everything seemed permanent and permanently wonderful. Siddhartha realizes he must leave and find out what is really going on. This is not an easy decision. By this point, he has a wife and he has a child. He also has a future as the future king. He's the son of a king. And renouncing everything, extraordinary power, extraordinary wealth, 
his own family, Siddhartha leaves and he seeks enlightenment. At first, he runs into various religious specialists who teach him the dominant religions of the day. And Siddhartha is deeply unsatisfied. He finally reaches some ascetics who will teach him through extreme forms of bodily mortification. He can break through this flesh and find the eternal self within. And he tries to practice this, but he realizes the mortification is not working in ways we will get back to. And more importantly, he realizes that what he is seeking through these practices, this eternal self, seems somehow wrong as well. So he leaves them. And he finally decides he will sit under a tree and continue sitting until he can achieve enlightenment. And he does. He begins to work through everything we have been discussing so far, his entire life up until that point, realizing the degree to which it was all illusory and realizing what was really going on, realizing his father's desires for his happiness, which was ultimately devastatingly self-destructive for the father, for the son, and for everyone involved, and his own complicit joining of that. And then he began to realize that his life was not simply those previous two decades. He began to recall his earlier lives, things he had done in previous lives as well, that had actually set him up for being in the position he was in. Indeed, he began to realize it was not just his father's and implicitly his own desires for permanence playing out in those past 20 years. It was, in fact, based upon things he had been doing for eons and eons and eons of previous lives. So it sounds like perhaps he was beginning to see that eternal soul that was traveling through life after life after life. But then he began to realize that no, he wasn't. Actually, even that very idea that he was a self traveling generation after generation through these eons was itself illusory. It was itself the equivalent of the creation by his father of that palace, this attempt to create a permanent thing, in this case, a permanent self, always happy and always existent and unchanging. And he realized even that was an illusion. At this point, he then realizes everything, not just his life, not just his previous lives, not just this self that he wrongly was thinking was traveling from being to being through the eons, but in the entire world he was living within was a product of eons and eons and eons of actions before him something he would come to know as the workings of karma. Where any time we do something to anyone else, anything else, that is not based upon pure compassion, we initiate suffering. And that suffering will not play out just as, in our quick earlier example, him yelling at a servant for not giving him his tea on time, creating immediate unhappiness, actually the consequences of these actions can play out for eons as well. To the point where the entire world we're living in is an accumulation, a false, illusory accumulation, but it does exist to our understanding that we have created through our immediate bad actions and the bad actions for lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. Realizing all of this, he then realizes that he must break this cycle of suffering. And to break this cycle of suffering, he must undergo the practices required to end all of the desires that is creating this world of suffering. Once he can do so, he realizes he will break this cycle and 
once he can break the cycle, he will cease to be creating the suffering for others, and he will be able to achieve enlightenment. Realizing this, the Buddha, I jumped just a couple of sentences, Siddhartha, realizing this, recognizes the truth of the world, what needs to be done, and how he, through an act of compassion, now breaking from his own desires, can help lead all of us to salvation. Siddhartha achieves enlightenment. When he does so, he achieves nirvana with remainder, meaning the following. Nirvana is the cessation of everything we have just been discussing. The cessation of all of the desires, desires writ large, including our angers, our jealousies, our desires for permanence, our desires for power, fame, wealth, control, domination, all of it. That is what is creating all of this illusory world that we have created for ourselves. Once we can break that, once we cease our desires, that is nirvana. It is the cessation, the wiping out of our desires. The reason, he has said at this point, to be, have achieved nirvana with remainder is he, and let's now call him the Buddha, exists. But he exists because of all of the past karma that had led to the birth of Siddhartha. He has now achieved enlightenment, but he still walks among us to spread these teachings. And because he has now ceased his own desires, he is a being of flawless compassion for all living beings. He then begins spreading these teachings, laying out the teachings that we have just been discussing, that in fact, the entire world of our experience is an illusory construct. Now, it's important to note here, the term illusion may sound like, well, it's just an illusion, so break past illusions on this, we'll see, this is not easy. Illusions create realities that we live fully within. Those realities are a direct product of our desires. That is what we are creating. Even when we think we are at our best, striving with our will to be successful. In fact, our entire will is based upon these desires. And what we thereby create is a world of suffering for ourselves and everyone around us. And moreover, as we have seen, it's not just that we and those around us have to live with the implications of the suffering we're creating for the next few decades while we're on the planet, this will play out for eons and eons and eons. Because the single biggest source of suffering that we create through these illusions is the self. This idea that we have a permanent self is itself a product of these desires for permanence. And insofar as our illusions create these realities that persist, that stuff that we create is what then comes back and back and back, as well as all of the suffering entailed with this thing that we have created. And if this is the case, we therefore need to cease our desires. To do so requires extraordinary levels of discipline, precisely because, as you can see, Everything we are living within, including most importantly, this thing we think we are, ourselves, is an illusion. All of it. And the discipline required is not the kind of radical asceticism that he had met, Siddhartha, when, his fr when he first left the palace. It rather is a process of meditation to break the cycle of desires and bring about pure, total, complete compassion, meaning a total and complete lack of desire. 
in any of the senses that we have been exploring. Again, this is not easy. Indeed, it is so difficult that for most of us, we will spend eons and eons and eons practicing these attempts, hopefully getting slowly better, hopefully creating less suffering for ourselves and those around us, and maybe in many, 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 many lifetimes, we will finally achieve nirvana. Maybe, <laughs> if we have incredible levels of discipline. Now, for some of us, we can take more radical actions, but the implications are harsh. We can do what Siddhartha did and actually leave our social roles altogether, leave society, leave our families, and begin to much more radical work of discipline than is possible while in lay society. Now, the Buddha knows very few of us will be willing to do this, but those few of us who are willing to do so can become the monks and the nuns devoting their lives to this level of discipline. But even there, one must be careful. Because if one does all that I just mentioned, and in a monastery simply works with this incredible discipline to break one's desires and achieve nirvana, that's selfish. That's selfish because it means you, you <laughs> are trying to achieve nirvana. You, yourself, meaning you've learned nothing. It's selfish. So, if you do all that I just mentioned, you leave your social role, join a monastery, undertake extraordinary levels of discipline, what you will be accomplishing is not an immediate nirvana. What you will be accomplishing is, as you still your desires, you will feel this level of compassion. And instead of taking the selfish act of saying, I will achieve nirvana, you will, on the contrary, devote your life to compassionate helping of everyone else. And you will not immediately achieve nirvana. And therefore, as difficult as it is to do that work, it doesn't end there. Because now the rest of your time on this planet will consist of actively trying to help those around you. And then you might think, OK, but then you pass away and can achieve nirvana. Um, no. What you should do is become a bodhisattva and continue the rebirth, meaning you will come back and continue that work of compassion for all of us. That is what you will do. Otherwise, you're being selfish. Now, as you can see, this is in its earliest formation, and not just in the earliest formation as we will see, this is a very radical movement. And let's work out very briefly the implications before we continue our narrative and work them out more fully. But pausing just a moment at this point, let us note the implications. Going back to the world that preceded the Buddha, it was certainly true in South Asia, you see permutations of everything we have been discussing as being typical throughout Eurasia. So there too, it was a world of social hierarchy into which you were born. You were born in the kingly class, into the priestly class, into the warrior class, or into one of the lower classes. In the South Asian version of this, that rebirth was based upon previous lives. So if you're born into being a Brahmin, the priestly class, it's because you had done great things in previous lives. If you're born in the lower classes, it's because you had not, meaning that you are deserving of your placement in the social hierarchy. And that world pre-Buddha was based entirely upon sacrifice. So this is what the Brahmins would do. They would sacrifice to the deities, and they, of course, had access to the higher powers and would do those sacrifices on behalf of the kings. Note the implication of what the Buddha is teaching. All of what I just mentioned is part of the cycle of suffering. All of it. The gods exist, but the gods exist as part of the cycle of suffering. 
and everything else that exists, the entire social hierarchy, is part of this cycle of suffering. And how do you break out of it? Not by performing the role of your class, priestly, kingly, warrior class, lower class, and accordingly achieving a higher rebirth, you achieve it through these spiritual practices, which therefore, most importantly, are open to absolutely everyone. Anyone can do them. And indeed, if anything, it is more difficult to do them if, like Siddhartha, you're born into the kingly class, because you will be born into a world in which, with that extraordinary wealth and power, you will be brought up thinking that you deserve this extraordinary world, and all of the world is there to serve your desires. So, not only is it open access to everyone, if anything, it is going to be more difficult if you're born into the higher realms, because breaking from that is extraordinarily difficult. And note two, the higher truth. The higher truth is emptiness. Emptiness, which is an extraordinary claim, radical claim. Emptiness meaning, ultimately, this entire world is a construct of humans, a construct, well, all living beings, I should say, a construct of all living beings and constructed through our base desires, including, most importantly, this thing that we think is us, namely the self. That itself is a product of our desires playing out for eons and eons and eons. And ultimately, what you are seeking is emptiness, a cessation of all of this. Now, religions often work in terms of the tensions they play out. And we've already seen a crucial one, but let me lay it out very, very clearly. Note, as we have seen repeatedly, this is not, and <laughs> it's almost be absurd to say this, to, 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 make, to, to claim it could be, but this is not an easy claim to achieve <laughs> emptiness. In other words, what I mean by that is the following. Um, ultimately, yes, your goal is nirvana, the cessation of all desires, and therefore pure, absolute compassion for all living beings. But note, it's built in that this is so incredibly difficult, it takes out any easy sense that, oh yes, I'll, I'll just you know, be a little bit less you know, <laughs> desirous of, of, of permanent things and a little less attached to beautiful objects and then I'll be getting you know, some nirvana. Uh-uh, I mean, yes, you should do what I just mentioned, but that's woefully inadequate in terms of the work you need to do. In fact, for most of us, we will spend lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes disciplining ourselves to be even get close to achieving this. And even the few of us, of us who might choose to join a monastery, again, you will not immediately achieve it, and you shouldn't because you would miss it because that's a selfish act. So note, the tension is ultimately, it is nirvana, and yet the focus is on the contrary, or sort of <laughs> in implication to get there, an incredible focus on everything you do in the most mundane aspects of your life. You are constantly, constantly learning to train yourself to see how your actions, even what we think of as our best actions, when we are using our will to create a better world for ourselves, we think, and those immediate ones around us, when you do that, you're the equivalent of Siddhartha's father and to the degree to which he's, he's complicit in this as a, as a young child, Siddhartha himself. You are creating an illusory world, and you are creating suffering. And that suffering won't just play out in your lifetime, it will play out eons and eons and eons. So it's teaching you to be incredibly attentive to everything you do, the intentions behind everything you do, to recognize the degree to which most of our lives are these constructs aiming at our own happiness, our own permanence, creating incredible suffering for us and those around us, and you're training yourself constantly to recognize this. 
So this is not a religion teaching you, okay, I should just you know, <laughs> cease acting in the world. That's not an option. You will be acting in the world, and probably for many, 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 many lifetimes. And therefore, the focus is this constant training all the time. Now, let me also, therefore, building directly upon this, say a word about meditation. One of the key practices that's been developed in the Buddhist tradition that has gone global. So, if any of you have practiced meditation, you will know Meditation is not only an incredibly difficult thing to do, um, it works. <laughs> and what I mean by that is as follows. If anyone tells you, and, and this has become a kind of standard part of corporate America, so many corporations in America will say, okay, yes, we, we want our employees to do a, a little meditation at, at you know, 10 a.m. Um, every day. And the idea is this will just calm you down. And if you're calm, then you won't be as anxious and worried, and you can be a better worker for our corporation. I'm not exaggerating. This is a very common thing in, in corporate America now. So meditation basically designed to calm you and help you be a good worker. Um, if they allow, these corporations, I mean, for the meditation to go on beyond the, you know, four or five minutes they, <laughs> they give you for this break, um, they will quickly realize it does not make you more calm and a better worker. Not at all. Meditation works. But meditation works for what it's designed to do. You are breaking the self. You are breaking the world that's been constructed around that illusory notion of a self. Your entire world is being shattered. You don't meditate and then become a really good worker for the corporation, otherwise unchanged. If you are doing it and doing it seriously, everything is going to change. Um, this, by the way, this is very sad to admit, but it's sad to know, but it is true. This is beginning to play out because sometimes when corporations do this, workers, not just for those five minutes, but will begin to do it a little bit more seriously and they find it psychologically very destabilizing. Like you need to have a teacher there saying, your entire world is going to be blown apart, <laughs> most importantly, including your conception of yourself. And when you're being told, oh, yeah, <laughs> you'll just be happier and calm if you meditate, uh-uh, you're not going to be happy and calm. You're going to have your entire world broken apart. So this is an intense, intense discipline with incredible implications. Now, let me go back to our narrative and play it out a bit further, and then we'll open this up for discussion. So, so far we have been discussing the teachings of the Buddha himself. Again, a rough contemporary of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle on the one side, Confucius and Lao Tzu on the other. As I mentioned briefly, a few centuries later, you will have the emergence of huge salvationist religions that will build upon these earlier ideas. In the case of Buddhism, this happens as well. In many forms, but the one that I'll be focusing on here today, is an emergence in the first centuries, first couple of centuries of, of the Common Era called Mahayana Buddhism, which li literally means Greater Vehicle Buddhism. This is a salvationist form of religion that will sweep across the Silk Road, become dominant in China, Japan, and Korea, and become the dominant form of Buddhism throughout all of Asia, throughout all of East Asia, I mean. And in this form, you will have a rereading of what we have just been discussing. So going back to the Buddha. So one of, and there are many different readings of him in the Mahayana tradition, but one of the ones I'd like to focus on here says, all that we just mentioned about the Buddha is the case, but the Buddha had actually achieved nirvana eons ago, eons ago. But the Buddha, as a compassionate being, keeps returning to teach us these teachings. And he chose to, re to reincarnate as Siddhartha Gautama precisely so it could play out the narrative that we can learn from because it's such an extraordinary narrative to see someone born into unbelievable wealth and power with only more wealth and power awaiting him once he becomes the king and to see that playing out can be such an incredible example to us that the Buddha chose to reincarnate himself in that form precisely as a teaching for us. And moreover, 
because the disciplines involved for us to achieve what the Buddha has achieved, in this case, eons and eons ago, it is so difficult that when the Buddha reappears, he actually reappears in order to grant us a greater salvation for those of us who will never be willing to undergo the kinds of discipline that is being required. And in fact, there are many Buddhas who are coming down to help us. And these Buddhas make available to us possibilities of salvation that would not require every single one of us to undergo this incredible level of discipline for lifetimes after lifetimes after lifetimes, but also as acts of compassion will do things to help us more immediately and do things to help the world around us cease to be as suffering. In other words, instead of saying, each of you must devote your lives, many, many, many lives, to this discipline, they will also come down and do things for us. Those things can involve all sorts of possibilities. Through deep devotion and faith in the Buddha, you can begin the work of achieving this breaking of your desires. They also provide teachings. So those in the monasteries, the monks and the nuns who have left society to gain the spiritual potency, they will gain a sense of what it is they can do in lay society to begin to create a better world. The very strong political sides of Buddhism will emerge out of this, where a Buddhist who will be a monk or a nun, precisely because they have left society, it is their ability, because of that spiritual potency, to stand up to what, for example, a state is doing and do things we could not imagine doing to ourselves, setting ourselves on fire as an act of protest, things we couldn't imagine. But you can if you've been one of those who's, who have been doing this sort of incredible discipline. And the tradition will emphasize those who have done so must be willing to take these extraordinary acts to help those of us who have not. And therefore, Buddhism becomes a powerful, powerful salvationist religion that becomes, again, a dominant part of much of Asia. Now, let me quickly say a few more words in this narrative, and then we'll open it up. You will not be surprised to hear, since it's been a running theme of the class so far, that these ideas, as is true for all of the great revolutionary ideas, have also been domesticated. Certainly, one of the key ones that we here now must worry about is the one I've just mentioned, but now let me say a few more words about it. As you have undoubtedly been picking up, I mentioned the notion of meditation, but even a lot of the terms these are probably not new terms to you. Um, much of this has been picked up in America, particularly, again, ironically enough, by corporate America, and domesticated literally into a form of simply ways to help calm yourself down to be happier in your life, right? So I mentioned the, the corporations in 10 a.m. say, okay, five-minute meditation, by which they mean you know, calm down and then you know, work harder <laughs> after you calm down, but one can expand the point. A lot of these terms have been picked up as just practices we can do to calm ourselves down and be happier in the world. But note, happier in the world in the way this has become picked up in corporate America is accept the world as it is and don't be too anxious about it, don't rethink it, and just do your job really well because you'll be calm and happy. Which, needless to say, is precisely what the whole story of the Buddha is out to undermine. When we do that, we are becoming the equivalent of Siddhartha's father trying to create this nice little palace where everything is perfect and we're just happy and content and not questioning anything because we don't see anything around us. That's, in essence, what is happening when the ways that corporate America has domesticated Buddhism. It's not just, it's not 
living up to the power of, of <laughs> Buddhism, it is undermining the key goal of Buddhism. Fortunately, as I've mentioned, for those few who really start doing these practices, that does not work. But again, if that's fortunate, it's also, as I've noted, psychologically devastating to the poor people who think <laughs> that they'll do meditation and just be happy and, and not question the world around them, um, find this utterly devastating. So it's a chilling form of domestication that not only takes out the power of Buddhism, but creates an incredibly dangerous dynamic. And part of the work, therefore, of truly taking Buddhism seriously is to take seriously the implications of what they are saying. Agree with it or not, the challenge of this is it is arguably the most powerful vision in all of the world religions and philosophy critiquing the notion of the philosophy of the, of the will based upon the unified self using his or her will to dominate the world, make the world better in, according to some vision, a view that is pervasive in various forms in many world religions. And note in Buddhism, you have as strong a vision as I think has ever been articulated critiquing a philosophy of the will critiquing all of the bases of that philosophy, including, most importantly, the notion of the self that is, is <laughs> using this will to impose a better order on the world for itself, and the claim that the entire world we are living in is not one that you are training yourself to live happily within. You are training yourself to think that the world you are living in is the equivalent of the palace Siddhartha's father built for Siddhartha. We have done the same for ourselves. Our entire lives are attempts to build these worlds where we will achieve immediate happiness, not recognizing, on the contrary, we are not only inevitably creating extraordinary suffering for ourselves, we are creating incredible suffering for those around us. And again, that suffering will play out for eons and eons and eons. And therefore, the focus must be at every moment, you are training yourself to see the degree to which how you act in the world, how you think about the world, how you think about yourself, and what you think is good for yourself, all of which almost assuredly are creating a world of suffering for everyone. And to break that and to become a figure of true compassion means a rejection of all that I just mentioned. It is an incredibly powerful vision, a vision that, again, we must be all the more <laughs> cognizant of, given the way it's being domesticated currently in America. And to take it seriously, as we're hoping to do in this class, means trying to wrestle with it in its most powerful articulation. So should we turn things over to you, Roberto? Yes, no, I just, yes. I, I just want to ask Why did the Buddha leave the happy house? <laughs> no, precisely. And part of the power of the story is everything seems perfect. I mean, why would you leave such a thing? <laughs> All you have to do is stay within it. And mm -hmm. even especially after you see someone age, it's like, okay, I've learned that, so go back to the palace. <laughs> and moreover, if he simply continues to play it out, not only does he get to live in this great palace, he's going to be the king, so we can build more palaces. <laughs> So why in the world? And I think what the story is saying is, and this is again pre-enlightenment, so but even pre-enlightenment, what he is beginning to realize is not just that this is a constructed illusory world, but that it is a constructed illusory world that is actually creating incredible suffering. And I think the sense of this, and again, this is pre-enlightenment, so this is, isn't something that some extraordinary being exclusively is capable of. I think the power of the story is saying, it's trying to get to us. Like, don't we all do this? I mean, we're not born you know, sons of kings, obviously, but, but, no, but, but at some lesser level, there, there don't we see that actually, even when we think we are happy, we're in fact creating incredible suffering. And I think that's part of the power of the story. There's <laughs> nothing inherent in it that would break it, but it's saying, but at some level we know, at some so level he knew. So there, there are two motives that you allude there to which you allude in your answer. So one is an intellectual motive, a cognitive motive. 
the Buddha wants to know what the real situation is. It's he suspects that it's not what it's made out to be. It's something else. Uh, the second motive is the motive of compassion. Yes. That he finds that there is the suffering. And somehow these two motives are to be connected. Precisely. That is, that if only he can understand correctly what the situation is, he will then have the path to the overcoming of suffering. Or at least realize he needs to get on the path. Yep. Uh -huh. Yep. And now, uh, so, so let's take, first of all, the cognitive motive. Yes. And its metaphysical elaboration in, yes. these, in these philosophies. So the background, the philosophical background, is one of those two major traditions of world philosophy to which we alluded in another class. Not the philosophy of deep structure, of, of a, a, an abiding basic structure of the world and the regularities that govern it, but a philosophy that we could call the philosophy of the timeless one. All the, the distinctions and changes that exist in the world are illusory, or if not entirely illusory, then epiphenomenal. And they're hiding the fundamental, the, the, the fundamental reality, which is that there is one thing, there is one being, uh, there is one reality, and it is timeless. Now, uh, one can make metaphysical objections to that view. So this on, on this question of curiosity as a motive. So uh, one could say, why does the world manifest itself to the beings that exist in it? in a form that's the opposite of its reality. That is, what is the reason for which reality conceals itself and traduces its own nature in the message that it conveys to this being? This doesn't seem to be explained, right? Or is it explained in some way? Well, the way they will do it is they'll put what you mentioned in the negative form. In other words, it's not that the world is one, and mm -hmm. there is an illusory structure that, that we have somehow fallen into and we need to recognize what the world really is. They'll put it in the negative form, by which I mean we experience a world that is structured, seemingly relatively permanent, even if we're going to die sadly, in general the world is, is what it is, and we experience that world. The move then is to say, that world we experience, ourselves relatively permanent for X number of decades, natural laws that seem to basically work um, and seem relatively permanent in general structure to society, all of that is illusory, but again, note that the, the notion of illusion, that the English word is, is somewhat misleading here, it's, it does exist, like we've created that world but we've created the world precisely as Siddhartha's father created the palace for Siddhartha. Like that is a world created out of our desires, in that case, desires of eons of humans. So there's this thesis mm -hmm. that everything is impermanent, everything is yes. ephemeral, but how do you get from the premise of everything being transitory to the premise that it's unreal? So those are two different things, right? The third position, yeah. the one that's not developed in the history of philosophy, is everything changes sooner or later, but is no less real on that account. So unlike this position that we're attributing to Buddha, it separates the ephemeral character of all phenomena from their unreality. It says a phenomenon is no less real because it is ephemeral. And so why is that not a much more immediately plausible view of the situation? How, how do they justify this jump from the thesis of transience to the thesis of unreality? So let me begin with one of your terms, which I think is, is absolutely correct. Uh -huh. um, 
this is not plausible, it is not intuitive, it is on the contrary radically counterintuitive. <laughs> now mm -hmm. again, let me emphasize the word real, like illusory, is, is a bit dangerous in English when, when discussing Buddhism. So when we say this world around us is not real, um, ultimately it isn't, but it certainly is real to our experience. And the counterintuitive claim is this is a constructed world. Now, while we are living within it, as we actively, sadly construct it from the Buddhist point of view, it certainly to us seems real. So I think I have a self. I think the world is relatively stable. Um, I think that, that the world is what it is. But in fact, the world is not what it is. Uh, this self that I think I have does exist right now, but that's because I've created it out of my desires. The entire world is a product of these desires, and the radically counterintuitive claim is the world is not what it is. <laughs> yes. So let me press you further. Yeah. So the, the, the greatest, or at least the most influential metaphysician in the Buddhist tradition is, is Nagarjuna. Yes and particularly associated with Mahayana Buddhism, yes. to which you referred. Uh, we attribute to Nagarjuna the following statement, that samsara, mm -hmm. meaning this realm of yes. illusion, of endless rebirth, yes. illusion and suffering, that samsara is nirvana. Yes. What does that mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. A key thing is, yes, no, no, and it's uh -huh. crucial because note, if we say um, once we break from all of this, there will be nothing, that's based upon a stable dualism, namely the world of endless suffering and this pure emptiness. However, as Nagarjuna will say, or, or and let me actually continue that thought before I get to the, the, the key point, same with this notion of a self. So I have this self. Once I achieve nirvana, I will have no self. But I've never had a self, right? <laughs> I've, that has never existed. I've created it, but it's never existed. This world, we've created it, not intentionally and through eons, but we have created it, but it doesn't really exist. So ultimately, this world of samsara is nirvana, and nirvana is samsara. Now, he, Nagarjan doesn't mean that in an easy sense. He doesn't say, and therefore we don't have to do all this work because you know, we're already achieved nirvana. But what it does mean is when, for example, the Buddha in the, the earlier version of the story, that he's a human achieving nirvana, it's not that he suddenly has no soul or has no self, it's that he realizes he, of course, never did. But so, well, it's, it seems that nir nirvana, or part of what is meant by nirvana, is not a change in reality, but a change in our attitude to this reality, right? The reality is samsara, this endless rebirth, this illusion, this striving. Uh, it's, what is it, ceasing to have the desire that it could be different from what it is. That is, it's what in the West was called amor fati, the love of fate. Uh, it's the acceptance of the world? It, no, <laughs> no, it, you're not accepting the world. You're ex understanding the world as a creation of our desires and is illusory. But then how is samsara nirvana? That is, it seems that there is, that, that it, it's, nirvana is not bringing samsara to an end, right? Because you, what, what you said before suggested that nirvana would mean samsara dissipates somehow. It's an illusion. It goes away. Does it go away? Not really. And, and so there are discussions uh -huh. of an ultimate eschatology in Buddhism, but most of the discussions are negative. And the view is, let's imagine every single living creature actually does all that we have just been discussing uh -huh. and achieves nirvana. First of all, that will never happen, but let's imagine for the sake of argument, it did. Um, what would happen? Well, then there are also origin stories of how we got to the world that, that we're currently in. And let me mention those to say what then what might happen in this putative world where we all achieve nirvana. So 
according to many of these origin stories, so there were in eons and eons and eons and eons and eons ago, these living creatures, we won't even call them gods or humans, they were something else altogether, um, who lived in this something, we won't even call the world because the world is, is that we know is a construct. And one of them, through some desire, one of the examples that's often given is one of them saw this little bright white thing um, that, that seemed really intriguing. And although these creatures didn't need to eat, it, this is pre-gender, picked it up and ate it. And it tasted really good, so they wanted more. But to get more, you had to grow more. And so out of this becomes the construct, but again, they exist, it's just they don't really exist, of things like the sun to grow more of these things. And soil in which they could grow. And the formation of individual things that would grow in the soil to gain nutrients through the sun that we would come to know as rice. And then we wanted more of these, and so we, we created more, and then we started creating social hierarchies to create more and more rice. Yeah. And then as we created those social hierarchies, we created genders, and we created, and so all of the world slowly is created, I mean, all the world that we know is slowly created, but all through, as you can see by the examples they're given, are desires. Now, finally, to get to your question, let's imagine everyone does all the work we're talking about, and everyone achieves nirvana. Well, probably it would happen again, <laughs> which means, in other words, the whole process would begin again, which means, getting back to the heart of your question, the story is not one of how do we achieve the final endpoint of a total nirvana. The sense is we will be, yeah. in our lifetimes and endless rebirths, in a world of desires that we will have, and so it's a constant work. But to along the way, desires. along the way, in, in the development of this metaphysical narrative, yes. there's the following problem. We, we have a world of change. Yes. Now, the way we understand change is we understand what something is by having a view of how it can change. Uh, and to not understand how something can change is not to understand it. So this, this is the fundamental conception mm -hmm. of, of our insight into the actual. Mm -hmm. The way to understand a physical phenomenon is to understand what it can become at the next stage through a series of interventions Absolutely. or under certain conditions. If we can't do that, we don't understand the phenomenon, oh. right? But uh, and so now the premise of that is time because without time, we can't make sense of this idea of change. So this seems to be a philosophy about change, yes. which denies the reality of the premise of change, which is the reality of time. Oh, no, except all it's denying is the likelihood that we're ever going to achieve some final nirvana for all living creatures. But to get to the heart of your question, um, let me begin with an example. So I mentioned very much in passing a Buddhist monk, among the things they'll be called to do, because they have taken the incredible step of leaving society and doing this discipline to act in ways that the rest of us in lay society could never act. So among the things they will do is, for example, they will refuse to bow to a king because they will say, we do not recognize the, spirit, the, the spiritual power of a king. Now, we accept the king at the moment has political power, but be, by refusing to bow, we also, therefore, will stand up to the king and protest the king when the king is doing wrong things, including extreme things like setting ourselves on fire, etc. So is that an attempt to create change? Absolutely. Is that an attempt to alleviate suffering? Absolutely. At a much more mundane level, when we are being called to note in our daily interactions, not, not as a monk, um, things that we are doing creating suffering, if we were working on those, do we create change? Absolutely. Now, is this going to lead us to a final perfect world? No, but that's part of the power of it. Okay, this is, so. an, it's not, I won't say endless process, but since it goes on for so many eons, from our perspective, it is an endless process. Well, so much for metaphysics. Let me go now to the other motive for which the Buddha would have left the Happy Valley, compassion. So when the Buddha comes back after his his trips, and he finally decides to live 
live definitively. Yes. According to the Pali Canon, mm -hmm. he picks up his son from, from bed, from the cradle, looks at him one last time and says, goodbye, I'm leaving. Uh, right, before he leaves, so he that's right. yes. So he yes. abandons his son and his wife. Yes. Now, how is that compassion? And what kind of sentiment is that yes. of this abandon? So we say, is this a compassion that's the opposite of love, of what we would call love? Uh, explain that. Absolutely. So, yes. Now, this is, again, before enlightenment, but it is absolutely uh -huh. true. To achieve enlightenment, he does exactly as you said. So he leaves the palace. He leaves his own family. He even looks at his own child before he walks out and does indeed walk out. The, and those very, very few of us, but those few of us who would choose to become a monk or a nun and join the monastery, we do versions of the same. So we would, be, we would leave our, our role, we would leave our families, and we would devote ourselves to these disciplines. Now, it is important to note, those few who will do this will indeed attempt a radical cessation of, of their involvement in this world to undertake this level of incredible discipline to then act compassionately on behalf of all of us. But note, a key part, and this is actually related to, to what we were discussing just before, is most of us, of course, will never become monks or nuns. <laughs> we will continue in our lives. We will continue in social reality. We will have families. We will yeah. have jobs. It's not calling on all of us to become monks and nuns. But what it is saying is, number one, those few who do must act in terms of absolute compassion for all living creatures because they've taken this radical act to do so. And for the rest of us who won't take that radical act, what we are training ourselves to do is to do it every aspect of our lives while we have friends, families, etc., but to note the degree to which we are constantly creating suffering by our actions. Okay, so just one more step now. Yes. To connect the metaphysical issue of yeah. the unreality of time and distinction with the moral issue of compassion or, or versus love. Uh, so, uh, um, suppose then the, the that No, I think I think I. Uh, let me not say that now. I'm going to say okay. it later in the in the course. So why don't you open up? Absolutely. Just let me one quick thing on on one of those sentences that we'll be uh, yeah. come back to, especially next week with Schopenhauer. But again, um, the claim that this world is illusory doesn't mean there's not change within it, though. <laughs> I mean, we still are actively trying to end the suffering around okay, us, so but so us and lay society and those, those who've taken the extreme act of leaving society. So, so it's not that there's no change. So let me insist then on what I was about to say. So, uh, so we think in, in the dominant tradition of Western yes. philosophy, of Western moral philosophy and moral psychology, that the content of our vitality comes from our engagements and connections, our connections with other people and the task in which we engage. Those connections and engagements presuppose a view of the reality of the world mm -hmm. and of its transformations, mm -hmm. and therefore the reality of time. And the premise is the world is real. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's only one real world. And the most important thing about the one real world is that it is what it is, rather than something else. So none of this business of perpetual transformation of the world into its opposite and so forth. Uh, but then we are assaulted in the midst of this engagement with the world with the suspicion that the world and our lives within it may be meaningless because we're unable to see the whole framework, the whole picture. So we have the engagement with reality shadowed by the suspicion of nihilism. And 
to the extent that we can deal with nihilism, it seems that our main way of dealing with it is not cognitive, but practical. We deal with nihilism by reaffirming our engagements and connections. So this is what David Hume says famously in passage in which he said, I have this philosophical delirium. I'm afraid that the world is meaningless. But when I feel that way, I go back to the gaming table and converse and play with my friends. And then all of this illusion dissipates. So, um, now, it seems then that we are presented here with a philosophy or a theology that tells us the way in which we can deal with death under the shadow of this suspicion of meaningless, meaninglessness is to die beforehand. So uh, uh, if by death we mean the draining of life of the content given by our engagements and connections. So the antidote to, the, to this feeling of, to this suspicion of nihilism under the shadow of mortality is a foretaste of death. And why is this world renunciation, in fact, not like dying beforehand? Yeah, I, I actually don't agree. And the reason I don't agree, and I'll begin with your, your opening mm -hmm. point, with which I agree fully. So you're absolutely right. One of the key moves of Buddhism is to say the world is not what we think it is. You're absolutely right. But one must avoid two possible readings, both of which have played out, but, uh, but I think have, have, have been dangerous. So the one we, we mentioned, and I'll be brief about it for that reason, um, is the kind of corporate America domestication. So, so it's all about just calming yourself down and, and, and being happier with the world. So that's one very dangerous approach. But another approach, and we'll see this to some extent next week with, with Schopenhauer's reading of Buddhism, but, but the second approach is to say, it's really about renouncing the world. It's, it's just world renunciation and don't try to, to do anything in the world, just renounce it. But note, that really isn't the teaching either. So the teaching is, no, the world is not what it is. And for the Buddha, or for those very few who will join a monastery and engage with the kind of discipline, but even they will become bodhisattvas in return for eons as well, doing the work. But even they, and we in a much more extreme sense, we're not renouncing the world. Like what I am doing if I am a Buddhist is I am spending every moment trying to see the degree to which I am constructing a world around me that is the equivalent of what Siddhartha's father was creating for Siddhartha. Like creating a world based upon my vision of a permanent self, my vision of my will, my vision of my immediate happiness, thereby creating endless suffering for myself and those around me. And I'm constantly trying to work on that, just as at a political level, if you're, again, to give the extreme example, a monk or a nun, you are expected to be super politically engaged, often at grave danger to yourself. Now, no, you're not seeking a utopia, but you are certainly engaged. So in our current lifetimes, we're not renouncing the world. We're still fully involved in the world. And, d and in that specific sense, going back to what we were saying before, there absolutely is change. Like if an intervention is successful, a corrupt king can be stopped, a horrible policy can be stopped. So there is change, and at a mon more mundane level, I can hopefully change my behavior of creating suffering. So there is change, I'm not immediately renouncing the world. So it's neither of these two extremes. It's not immediate renunciation, it's also not the <laughs> corporate version of just calm down, it's realizing the world is not what it is, but we have created it, and therefore that becomes the impetus for trying to change it. Why we Let's open it up. <laughs> yes. So then, not surprisingly, <laughs> tons of hands. I have no <laughs> idea who is first, so, so kind of randomly. Yes, please. Early Buddhism was a reaction in some ways to uh, the Upanishads, and this 
Why is that the, the, the agent of the medicine doesn't know exactly what the pathology is, what, what basically is causing cancer is fermenting in the body. But the, the reality is that from the one place and all the other uh, manifestations are the illusion. And uh, once you go back and you realize that there's only one thing that exists, then that's when salvation comes in. But uh, Buddhism is in a certain way the correct way of life. But still, in the present, there's no, no one thing. Yet. There is the, 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 the self is not a permanent thing that is here, that is completely changing the world. So it's in a, in a certain way a, a reversal yeah. of the common sense of the self. But uh, this, this, in turn, when we move into the Mahayana metaphysics, <coughs> in a certain way, in a strange way, it goes back to circle. And then you go back, let's say, let's say maybe you are in the, the, uh, in the Mahayana metaphysics, uh, there is the idea of the Sakatakala, the, the idea that we are already Buddha. And that, that's sort of what makes sense of, of samsara samsara, because there is already a true self. The true self is the Buddha self. And you only have to sort of chip away all the problems, all, all the beliefs that are around it, and then you have become the true self, and the true self is the Buddha self. And that's completely opposite of what original Buddhism is. Uh, the same thing with the, the idea of the world. The, uh, the Buddha did not deny the existence of the world, but he didn't deny the permanence of the world. Right? But something happened along the way that is very similar to uh, the revolution from Lao Tzu uh, Leibniz, uh, his, his proof of the existence of God, that he said, well, if every being depends on another being, and that being depends on another being, that is, you know, at some point in the chain, you know, a being is not fundamental. So what the, 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 the Mahayana mystification says, well, you know, uh, everything is God, everything depends on something to it. So when you go, you go back, when the step you, you, you find the same thing, and then you go back, 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 and then you go and that's when the true reality is that it's permanent, or, or, or it's not one thing. So, so I think, I think that that's, that's the, the main thing that sets off this contradiction that I have in the present book. Yes, I think that's beautifully put. And the way I would sum it up, actually, is to say Buddhism doesn't operate through assertions about ultimate reality. It operates negatively. In other words, the, the constant push of Buddhism, and I think your, your, your description shows this beautifully, the constant push of Buddhism is to say things we assume should constantly be broken. So if the problem is perceived to be our perception of a permanent self, you push against it. If the, pr if the problem is seen to be an overcommitment to a single monistic vision of the cosmos, as you said correctly in the, in the Upanishads, you push against that. If the position is seen to be one that, oh no, no, the world is what it is and there is no ultimate oneness, then you push against that. And so the assertions always operate negatively, which means when you do a history of Buddhist metaphysics, you seem to get, as you said, completely contradictory positions, but exactly as you said, that's because the goal is not assertions of ultimate reality, it's breaking our understandings and perceptions of what reality is. That's the constant push. And since always our perceptions and experiences of reality are going to be limited, that's the constant push. So in a sense, the way to do a history of it is exactly as you're saying, it's what are these pushing against? So. When you're pushing against the Upanishads, you're going to push one thing. When you're pushing against Taoist metaphysics and then China a millennium later, you're going to push against something very, very different. And that's the push. So going back to, we had to briefly leave, but going back to his, his point, you're constantly saying the world is not what it is. But what you perceive to be the world as it is, that's what you're trying to say it's not. So yeah, in a sense, it's a constant pushing negatively against existing conceptions. So yeah, thank you. I think that's a beautifully put. Yes. Yes, please. I'm curious about how this Buddhist concept of the fallacy of the self relates back to the distinction between love and altruism that was made earlier yes. in the course. Um, because under the definition that I believe you guys laid out, yes. um, it stated that love involves a recognition, recognition of the other and a recognition of the self of the other. Yes. And so under this paradigm, would it be impossible for a monastic in a Buddhist community to experience love? Or would any love for the Sangha or love for community or love for others be a form of altruism rather than love? And, and how would that shape that? Yeah, beautiful question. And I think the answer would be love is, in, is the way you've articulated very correctly, love in the sense of my love for another self 
um, yes, you would be immediately pushed in the Sangha to say, whoa, <laughs> are you sure that is not an attempt to claim out of your desires that there is some self there that I love, I am a self, this is a self, we are some kind of a match, and we love each other because our selves match. Is that not a product of desires at every level? First, that that permanent self exists and the person I claim to love, that I exist as a permanent self? And are you sure, therefore, it's not something incredibly insidious? Rather than, than what we would think of as a wonderful love for another, it's at some very gross base level a desire for permanence in which we are creating for ourselves and for this other person intense, unbelievable suffering. Now, that's sticking to your, your excellent example of in the monastic community, what about us, lay people? Um, it would be the same issue, but it would be to a lesser extreme, by which I mean we would still have families, right? But in our families, you're constantly trying to push against or recognize the degree to which you are likely falling into all the dangers I just mentioned. So am I really loving this person or am I really trying to create this thing that I believe to be permanent and I'm attached to because I think it leads to my happiness when in fact, I am in fact, in practice doing something horrible to that person, myself, and the many others that would be involved. So yeah, excellent question, thank you. So tons of questions, I have no idea what the order is. So actually, let me go this way and then this way, if that's okay, yes, please. Yeah, no, beautifully put, because you're absolutely right. The commitment is that one will inevitably, inherently, or inevitably is even too weak a word, inherently lead to the other. In other words, to the degree to which I can begin to not act according to my desires, I don't even recognize my desires, I think it's just my will based upon what's good for myself, but in fact, from a Buddhist perspective, it's simply my desires. The degree to which we can begin to break that is the degree to which we also can begin to have compassion for living creatures around us. And in the Buddhist tradition, they're, they're seen as inherent. That my inability to have true compassion is based upon the fact that I work in the world that is a product of my desires and I act accordingly. And as I break that is the degree to which I can truly have compassion for, li for living creatures. Yes, please. Oh, great question, and that's why they're inherent. So, so and you're right to catch my wording. If, if it's a desire for compassion, it's still a desire. <laughs> in other words, so, so it's, a, it's a beautiful way where I was, in my wording, falling into it. So yes, if I say, I desire compassion for all beings, I should be aware, and you all should catch me on it immediately by saying, yeah, Michael, but are you really <laughs> in fact, being compassionate, or are you making some kind of a claim to make us respect you? Oh, great Michael wants compassion for all creatures out of some desire for him to be seen as a great person. So the answer is yes. If I am desiring compassion, I'm probably falling into something that is not even remotely compassionate. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> But again, this is, this is what you're training yourself to do constantly. You're training yourself to constantly question the degree to which our actions in the world are not, in fact, based upon very, very dangerous forms of desire. Very, yeah, please, please. Very da dangerous forms of desire. Oh, please, follow up, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great question. And it goes back to, to Roberto's earlier question. Um, we're not going to achieve a perfect world. So in the world, by definition in our lifetimes, but this will go on for eons, um, it will be a world that is being constructed by our desires 
and hopefully more and more of us will begin trying to break our desires. But sadly, we should be aware that living creatures will keep falling into this, so that work is endless. So we're not going to achieve a final moment of perfect salvation for all living creatures. Or again, as we mentioned before, hypothetically, if we did, it would just restart because someone at some point or some thing, some creature at some point would say, oh, look, what's that white thing? And then the whole thing would begin again. So what it means is endless work, constant. So there is change through that work, but it's endless. You're not going to achieve a final state. I mean, all of, real, all of, all of living creatures, I mean. Well, it's not necessarily an equilibrium. It's constantly working against our desires. So it creates better worlds, but, but then there's always a danger we fall back into it. So it takes out an, an easy redemption story. Yeah. So, but, but Michael, just to, to sharpen the last remark yes. I made in my interrogation, uh, nihilism, the suspicion of meaninglessness, has a theoretical antidote and a practical antidote. So the theoretical antidote is our picture of ultimate reality, in which we profess to teach ourselves what the secret of the universe is. And but the practical antidote to nihilism is none of that. Is the practical antidote to nihilism is not metaphysics. The practical antidote to nihilism according to Hume's story, is making merry with your friends and everything around them. That is, it's real social life. It's engagement in a real social world. That's the practical antidote to nihilism. So here we seem to have a view in which there is a contradiction between the theoretical antidote to nihilism and the practical antidote, because the metaphysical narrative is a narrative that tends to undermine or to discredit the reality and the significance of our particular attachments and engagements and replaces them by this diaphanous universal compassion. Well, yes, except remember, we aren't going to achieve that, right? And so, so it's not like I now am going to renounce the world and have universal compassion. I mean, if I said that, you should correctly you know, say, Michael, no, you're falling into exactly what, what the teachings are saying not to fall into. So I'm not going to right now be able to accomplish this. And that's crucial. I mean, this is, I was, this is the tension I was mentioning in Buddhism that they push very strongly, that ultimately you're achieving nirvana. But I mean, we're talking eons and eons and eons of lifetimes away, and you probably won't achieve it then. So in terms of my reality in this life, in this current self that I've constructed, in this world that we have constructed, um, I'm not renouncing things immediately. I'm not achieving nirvana immediately. That's not even a remote possibility for me. My work is the constant work of discipline, of trying to break my desires and create less suffering in the world through compassion. Yes. And I think I'd said this direction first, we'll sort of go th back and forth. Yes, yeah, so please, yes. Um, I wanted to follow up on the kind of misconception of nihilism itself, right? Yes. Talk about the ethical implications. Yes. Because my understanding is that there are teachers in the Pali Canon of the, the Buddha uh, in response to the direct question of is there a self or is there not a self? Yes. He refuses to answer. Right. Right. And he tells his companion that, you know, I can't say there's a self, I can't say there's not a self. Yes. So it's this kind of rejection of there being a binary. Precisely, right? precisely. And so to me, my reading of that is that the ethical implication is that, you know, if, there, if we just accept that there's no such thing as a self, we're not real. Yes. You could kind of abdicate your responsibility right. and just give up and not, it doesn't matter what you do. Yes. Whereas if you accept that the self is not binary, that it is ever changing, yes. it's not permanent. Yeah, I, I think that's 
Uh, yeah, that's a beautiful way of putting it because again, Buddhism operates through negations of the standard ways we build worlds that, that prevent us from doing the work we should be doing. So when they push the no-self argument, that's assuming a world correctly that most of we humans believe we have a self and the problem is therefore to push against that. And the intent of doing so is exactly as you mentioned. Now, if we putatively imagined a world, I mean, I, I don't think it would happen, but let's putatively imagine a world where all living creatures tended to assume they didn't have a self and, and that ceased to be a problem. I think you're exactly right. In that world, a Buddha at the time would come in and push a notion of a self, <laughs> precisely to push against that. Because uh, truly to say as an assertion, there is no self, if one took that to mean and therefore I don't have to act in the world and do anything in the world, then the Buddha would have to push against that. So I think you're exactly right. Think of these, these arguments as negative pushes against our assumptions, our assumptions being from a Buddhist perspective, assumptions we make that create these seemingly stable realities in which we don't have to act outside of, of our very base desires, and the push is constantly against that. And all of these arguments, no self, the world is illusion, etc. exactly as you said, they're pushing against our assumptions. And again, putatively, if we could imagine a world where those weren't our assumptions, they would be pushing the other direction. So yeah, I think that's beautifully put. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, please, please. But then how do you reconcile that with the, the narrative of the rebirth and karma as like, there, there being some sort of essential soul or self that yes. like, right? So I, I don't Precisely. Know and, th and the answer is we do, so again, illusion in, in English is a, is a somewhat misleading term. The, the, our actions do create things. So we create the worlds around us and we create a self through our desires that does in fact go on and on and on. Now there are many metaphysical discussions of what this means. So what it means is in a world of constantly interacting things, so the world of causation is the world of, of karma, our desires create certain stable things, stable not being a good thing, <laughs> needless to say in this metaphysics, a stable thing that then continues. Long after my death, it will continue. So it comes back and back and back. It doesn't even come back, it just sort of continues, just you know, I die and it takes another form, uh, another, another living creature. So in that sense, it it exists, not in the, in the way we would use the word illusory, it exists in that sense, but you absolutely can and should break it because that creation is based upon these very base desires. So you're right, in practice, does there seem to be something that's recurring? Yeah, in fact, you can even take seems to be out of that sentence. There is something that's recurring, it's just that it's something that we have created and it's a horrible thing that's creating incredible suffering. So yeah, I think that's an excellent way of putting it. Thank you. And let's jump back here, so please. Oh, no, okay, yeah, please. <laughs> There's plenty of time, so please, yes. Yes. What's the definition of suffering? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so basically, um, think of suffering as the implications of a world based upon desires, so based upon desires in the specific sense of attempts to create stable realities in which we don't have to see what's really going on, and then, getting back to the heart of your question, what suffering would be would be the implications of that world. So as you can see, it's an incredibly open-ended definition. So concretely, what is the suffering being created by Siddhartha's father when he creates that palace? It's multifold. Um, it's ultimately suffering for Siddhartha because he's being brought into a world in which he is actively being prevented from seeing what is really going on. It's creating suffering of those around him because everyone has to play into his act to, to hide what's really going on. Everyone has to, when he's you know, screaming, I want my tea, you know, the servants have to train themselves not to show their annoyance at, at how he's treating them. So it causes suffering for them. At a deeper level, it causes incredible suffering because of the expense required for this palace, an expense that he is not allowed to see in terms of the implications it has for the social world. And he is, he in his constructed world, he literally doesn't see that. 
And then by implication, this is how we are living our lives, which means suffering is the product of, in this grand sense, of basically most of what, sadly, we humans are doing in our lives. So it's the product of not seeing the implications of our actions to those around us. Now, wonderful question. Thank you. And let's jump back here. Great, please. Yeah, great question, and, and I think it's, it's a wonderful comparison because there is a really, I think, significant difference here. So Plato, with the allegory of the cave, really wants to claim that there is a higher reality that we have access to that we should be following, and what I mean by that is the following. So very quickly, of course, the allegory of the cave is we as humans live in a world of constant change and experience the world that way and base our values upon that, Whereas the few philosophers amongst us understand that there is a permanent world of ideas above, and in that world, there is absolute pure stability, and the philosopher knows that only that world of stability should be followed, and only those few who can do so should become the philosopher kings and therefore rule the world because the rest of us are stuck in this mundane reality. Now, at first glance, it sounds like Buddhism is simply inverting this um, and saying, well, no, the problem is thinking that there is a stable reality and we're trying to break that down. But no, it goes back to a few points made earlier, it's not simply saying the opposite because what Buddhism is saying much more strongly is you should not be, make, you should not be living your life on assertions of ultimate reality because those will almost assuredly be, be based upon these desires that we tend to fall into. So this is why you're constantly operating in the negative sense. So if we are in a world where we think it's simply an unstable reality, um, I don't think Buddhists for the most part see that as the problem that we tend to fall into that, but if we did, then pushing against that would be helpful. Since from a Buddhist perspective, our much bigger danger is we tend to think the world is what it is, that there just are stable things that sadly eventually will pass away, but in general, it's a stable world they see that as the problem they need to push us against. But underlying this, of course, is the move. See the degree to which we are creating these horrible worlds that we don't even recognize as horrible, precisely by the way we're creating them. Yes, please, yeah, follow up, please. Precisely. No, and I think this is part of the power of the tradition is, you're right, it will deny a platonic argument that there is a clear, true reality that can be the basis of our decision making, including our morals. Um, it's all based upon recognizing the degree to which our actions are suffering, and going back to the earlier question too, suffering is read as incredibly broadly such that we should be assuming what we are doing is constantly creating suffering, and again, there's no easy answer as to what would be the proper rule to follow. So a lot of the discipline, there, therefore, and not just for, for monks, I mean, the discipline for we in lay society is constantly recognizing the degree to which our actions, our social worlds, the laws of states, etc., are creating suffering and constantly realizing how we can act against them. Now, again, monks and nuns can do more than we can because they can <laughs> undertake but, uh, incredible things we can, but we can do so constantly too. But yes. I just wanted to make a correction here. So the metaphysical assumption of this view is not that there is no reality. It is that the reality is a timeless one. So the ultimate source of all suffering in the world is resistance to this timeless one. And pretending that the distinctions and transformations that appear in the world are for real. But that's, but there is a metaphysical thesis. 
Yeah, I mean, yes, but going back to what we were saying before, it's a negative one. In other words, it's not, let's assert everything is it one denies and derives morality accordingly. It one. denies the, rea the reality of distinct cells and distinct yes, things absolutely. in the world and the reality of the epiphenomenal changes in the world. Yes. But it asserts that something else is real. As a negation. In other words, what yes. I mean by that is, um, and this is, and again, why Plato is such a nice contrast, it's not saying, let's begin as the starting point the assertion that all is one and derive from that a morality. The move is the negation, of the, the, the operating negatively. We must recognize the degree to which the world we are living in is a construct of our desires, and we must break against that. And because it's put negatively, going back to the question, it doesn't give you a predefined morality. It's not, you can't say, well, once we, if, from a basis of oneness, we'll know what to do because that claim of, of oneness, even when it appears, is a negation. It's, it's arguing against uh -huh. the world that we perceive to be the real world. It's, it's, it's strange to contrast Buddha and Plato in that way because they actually have a similar background in the ancient Indo-European view. So there's a structure, a, a social structure of society of castes. The, the priests and philosophers are on top, then the rulers and fighters, then the workers and peasants on the bottom. The structure in society is parallel to a structure in the soul. The rational faculties on top, then the action-oriented impulses of vitality and courage associated with the fighting and ruling classes, and then the central appetites associated with the workers and peasants. And you neglected to mention that the Republic also contains an allusion to the karma narrative in the myth of error. So there's the same background in which these philosophers proceed in a somewhat different direction. Yeah, although I, I, I take out the somewhat because Plato agrees with all that you said, yeah. and the Buddha needles say, would, would say yes, that's again. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed, exactly. Yes, because exactly. it's also a later moment in the dissolution of this Indo-European view. Yeah, although they're relative contemporaries. Yeah, but but the, 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 there's much more in the development in the subsequent development of Buddhism, especially Mahayana Buddhism the push against this narrative continues and deepens. Tons of, oh, please, yes, yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, great questions. Let me give a, a two concrete examples. So one, a political one, and then one getting back to the heart of your question about it, we and our personal relations. But let me just give um, a political example. I mentioned before Buddhist monks setting themselves on fire to, to protest government policies. But I think an even more telling one for where you're going is think of Gandhi, who isn't just a Buddhist, but he's certainly building out a Buddhist among other traditions. So the way that Gandhi is responding to the British Empire isn't simply to say, let us revolt against the British army. The move on the contrary is to force the British to recognize the degree to which their empire is not what they claim it to be, in other words, spreading enlightenment throughout the world, but in fact is simply a product of incredible violence based upon their desires for power. And how does he do it? He actually has his followers, I mean, it's amazing, the discipline that's required to do this, to literally walk up to British soldiers and allow themselves to be beaten in front of the cameras. Um, and the idea is that will force both them <laughs> and, I mean, the beaters, but also people in London seeing pictures of this in the newspapers, seeing this is your empire. 
And the whole thing works by forcing the British to recognize what they were really doing and, and he saw this as directly related, at the same time, helping his followers gain the kind of discipline both to do this, which is incredible, but also, as he said, to therefore gain the potency once liberation is achieved to actually build a better world. So there, is there a universal moral system? Not really, but is there a guide for how to act? Absolutely, and the guide comes from sensing in this current world, what is the creation of incredible suffering and what are the concrete steps we can do to intervene to force a change, force a recognition, in this case on the part of the British, and to force, in this case for his followers, changes we can make to build a better world. Now, let me then move to the heart of your question. At a more mundane level, daily interactions, what would this mean it would mean we're essentially doing the same thing, right? Constantly recognizing the degree to which we are acting in ways that are creating suffering, in ways we often don't realize, catching the degree to which those around us are doing the same, but we are therefore trying to reform ourselves, but also act in ways that will help those around us to change. And what that will mean will vary by definition, but you do in a sense have a general guide, like the guide is recognizing the degree to which the suffering is being created by our actions and those around us, and you're trying to sense the ways in which you can break this. And I might add, it actually goes back intriguingly to the questions before about metaphysics. Essentially think of Buddhist metaphysics, again, you almost have to use scare quotes when you use the word, as kind of operating along the same lines, right? If we tend to assume we have stable selves, Buddhist teachings will push the doctrine of no self because it's what we need to be pushing against. If we, again, <laughs> imagine we were assumed a world of no self, tough to imagine, but if we tried to, they'd be pushing the opposite direction. So in any situation you're trying to sense what are the assumptions people are allowing themselves to live under, creating suffering, and how do we act and intervene in the world to break those? It's part of the, I think, power of the tradition because what that means in practice will, by definition, vary dramatically. So thank you, wonderful question. Yes, please. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, and I would say for the issue you mentioned, yes, but of course that underlines the, the larger point we've been making as well, which is that where would, you, where would one stop according to the different philosophies? And the reason I, I put it in that odd phrasing is with a Hegel, there's a, a clear vision where you'd stop, right? That the entire history of the world operates according to a teleology, aiming as long as we're going upwards in a certain direction. So you know what, say, lesser philosophy, you know what the better philosophy is, you know where you're going. Um, so at certain moments in the dialectic, could you see parallels? I, mean, I think the answer is you certainly could, but where Buddhists would strongly oppose Hegel is they would say, at certain moments, yes, but where they would reject is the overall teleology because they would say any overall teleology by definition is imposing a pre-given structure that almost assuredly would be based upon desires, forms of domination. In the case of Hegel, those would be <laughs> very, very clear. So he'll construct his entire teleology where all of the world philosophies that are outside the West are at the lowest level. Then, of course, you work up through the development of Christianity, its secularization under himself, under Hegel, and the teleology. So clearly based upon all of the incredibly dangerous <laughs> desires of empire and ethnocentrism dominant in the early 19th century. So the Buddhist critique would be there. Now, getting back to the heart of your question, along the way, could you see parallels? Definitely. But 
That's why ultimately the Buddhist metaphysics, again using that word in scare quotes, is always about pushing against any acceptance of some kind of overarching structure that would then guide us, because that's where we're going to be falling into our dangers. Yeah, thank you, great question. So lots of questions, I think you were next, I'm kind of guessing, but I, there's plenty of time for all of us. So, oh, no, I'm wrong, okay, so please. Okay, please, yes, please, yeah, please correct me, Sasha, <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> sure, th there's actually, we're, next week we'll be discussing Buddhism as well, so there's plenty of time. Yeah, it beautifully put, and I'll begin by saying I, the places where I share your skepticism, but then turn to the, the hopefully more optimistic implication. So to begin with the skepticism, uh, yes, I mean, to give the extreme example I was mentioning before, corporate America, I mean, it's, it's almost a gross example of exactly what you're saying, where you take a set of assumptions about the self, about the world, and Buddhist meditation is literally brought in to simply get people to be more accepting of, <laughs> of that world. So literally just appropriating these, these practices for the precise opposite of, of why they were developed. And I think you're right, just a lot of discussions of comparative philosophy fall into basically the same danger, hopefully not quite as extreme, but, but comparably. Now, having mentioned that skepticism, let me turn to the more optimistic possibility, which is that if you look at the longer arc of Buddhism, I mean, this, this comes back to the earlier question before about Buddhism's response to the Upanishads and how differently it's going to be playing out in China. And let me just take that point to elaborate. So if you look at the larger history of Buddhism, note the dramatically different ways that again, quote unquote, metaphysics operates, oftentimes almost in opposite ways, based upon the context it's operating in. And the reason I mention that is part of the power of Buddhism since it's not based upon a doctrine of X is the real reality and therefore do, do the following, but it's always operating negatively, what it's operating when it's effective is seeing the dominant assumptions of the world around it in whatever context that is and working against those. So getting back to the heart of your question, what this would mean for us is what would it mean for us if we want to take this seriously, you know, agree or not, but take it seriously and wrestle with the implications, what would it mean in the contemporary world to do so? Um, which would mean not the easy appropriations in which nothing is being questioned, but rather the strong form where it would have to be questioning the world around us, meaning that the metaphysics would have to be worked on because that's not really what the tradition cares about. The tradition cares about breaking these, these stable assumptions, and what would that mean now? And let me just mention, this is a perfect way to conclude today's discussion, because next week we will be embedded in exactly that. <laughs> so next week we will turn to Schopenhauer, who is, of course, a 19th century European thinker, but very influenced by Buddhism, very much taking Buddhist ideas and trying to work out their implications, and what we will do next week is essentially that question. We will look at how Schopenhauer appropriated these ideas and tried to rework them. We will also, as always, critically engage him. So are we convinced that he did so well? If we are not fully convinced, what would it mean, coming back to your question, to do it well and to do it in a different way that would be more successful? And so Schopenhauer is a brilliant thinker, we will try to work through what he is trying to do with the Buddhist tradition and evaluate that and in a way trying to come back to your larger question. So thank you again, as always, for an amazing discussion and we very much look forward to the continuation of it next week. Thank you.
very glad we do have Schopenhauer in this yeah. together. It's literally ten hands to rock. So we, yeah. can, we can take the net and we can put the sword in the it takes now, so In, you know, Wordsworth, Wordsworth ha has a pamphlet he wrote called The Convention of Sintra. The, the Convention of? Of Sintra okay. in Portugal. Sintra. Oh, yes, yes. It's C I N T R A. And there's this wonderful passage in which he talks about the explosion of life, of humanity, of ordinary humanity, ordinary men, in festivals, in engagements, in uh, all these things that are going on in the world. And he says, the great sadness of human existence is that uh, the, is, is that the objects of these desires rarely correspond to their intensity, to their merit. Mm -hmm. So there we have a different idea, that the aim is to elevate human life yes. by providing desire with its worthy object. Yes. Can I take this one? Yeah. Oh, yes. please, yes, yes. Sure, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, as opposed to the idea